Good morning, everyone. We're continuing our series looking at emotions in the Christian life, Christianity inside out. And today we're looking at sorrow and how sorrow is a gift from God. In the movie Inside Out, one of the animated Pixar movies, there is a character, Joy, a bubbly, happy character, one of the emotions of the person in the movie. She's trying her best to keep everything light and happy and fun. Surely there's nothing wrong with that. But then there's another emotion, sadness, who just has a way of making things a little bit unhappy of not always putting the most bubbly spin on everything there. And so joy, the emotion joy, tries to keep sadness in a box, tries to keep her out of the way, tries to make sure that she doesn't mess anything up. But in the movie, we see that sadness is important, that sadness actually has a place and that without the ability to have sadness, to have sorrow, there is something deeply missing. We need to find a way to respond appropriately to the sadness that there is in our world. And so sorrow is God's gift to humanity for a world that is sometimes full of sorrow. Sorrow is good. It is appropriate to be sad about what is sad. And we'll see that today in today's passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 5 to 16. Firstly, we'll see why our world needs sorrow. Secondly, we'll see the difference between godly and ungodly sorrow, according to the passage. And thirdly, God's intention for sorrow. So let's begin then with why our world needs sorrow. Well, it's because there are things to be sad about. Imagine our sometimes very sad world, but with no sadness in it. It almost sounds horrific. It sounds inhuman and it sounds destructive as well. The ability to be sad is good. And every kind of human grief and sadness and sorrow is depicted in the pages of the Bible, whether it's the result of adverse circumstances, of sickness, of parting relationships, of personal loss, of failure, of personal sin. There are so many times when it is right to be sorrow, sorrowful, to be sad at what happens in God's story. And it reflects God himself. It reflects Jesus. As we see from today's other reading in Luke chapter 19, in verse 41, as Jesus and his disciples were approaching Jerusalem, it says that he saw the city and he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Jesus here is sorrowful over the city and the people in it. This city that was meant to be a beacon to the nations around it. And instead, he knew would be destroyed. There was just a shadow of what it should have been because of its continued rebellion against God. Jesus is rightly sorrowful about this, despite the fact that he knows that the people in this city are going to turn on him and in a short time are going to crucify him. And so when we come to our passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, we again see someone who is sorrowful over the people in their care. We have Paul and we have the people of the church in Corinth. And Paul has a history with the Christians in Corinth. He'd stayed there a long time even amongst lots, much opposition, he planted a church there and he cared deeply for them and was therefore shocked when he heard of all the ways that they'd apparently compromised 
on what he taught them. They'd ended up fighting over which impressive Christian leader they should follow rather than following Christ himself. They'd ended up misusing the freedoms that they had as Christians, twisting them to somehow give them permission to do whatever they wanted with their bodies and other people's bodies with no regard to the hurt, to others, to themselves, and to the name of Jesus as well. Even doing this on such an extreme extent that there are reports of incest being celebrated amongst members of the church. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, that this is something that even the non-Christians around them do not tolerate. Paul is so distraught at their behavior that he visits them again in what he calls uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the painful visit. Painful because of what he had to say to them and because most of them ignored him on that visit anyway. But he doesn't give up. He doesn't give up on them. He sends another letter. One he says was written in anguish and tears as he refers to it in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And so this is the letter. This one written in anguish and tears is the one that Paul is referring to in verse 8. And this is the letter that seems to have finally got through to lots of the Christians there. And so Paul writes about it in verse 8 of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Even if I caused you sorrow in my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Paul did not enjoy causing them sorrow or hurting them, but he doesn't regret it because he sees that it was necessary. So we see why our world, and sometimes us as Christians, need sorrow. We need to be able to be sorrow, uh, sorrowful about the world around us and also sorrowful about our own sin as well. And so secondly, we see in this passage the difference between godly and worldly sorrow. Paul writes that he is happy here. Not that they were sorrowful, but that their sorrow, when faced with their sin, led them to turn back to Jesus. Because repentance isn't always a given in those circumstances. He writes in verse 10, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. So there are two types of sorrow uh, that can be experienced when faced with our own sin. One that leads to salvation, one that brings death. The difference couldn't be more stark. Godly sorrow leads to turning back to God. Worldly sorrow leads to turning away from him even further. Godly sorrow is sorrow that we didn't follow God's way, whereas worldly sorrow, it seems to be sorrow that we didn't get our own way in this context here. Now, I've said already that, that sorrow is a gift from God in a world where there are so many things to be sorrowful about. But this here is why it's something that as Christians we can't, it's something we can't do without. Without sorrow at our own sin, there is no repentance. You can't turn back from something unless you realize you were going the wrong way and had made the wrong decision in the first place. But what's more, this godly sorrow, it says here, it leaves no regret. What an amazing image of being free from the lie, the lies that sin can tell us. Because regret is sin accusing us and drawing us deeper into itself, bringing death. But remember, as verse 10 said, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no, no regret. So sorrow, when faced with our sin, it can be good. But wait, there's even more. As well as encouraging the people in Corinth 
uh, to give thanks for the godly sorrow that they've experienced, Paul shows them, thirdly, that God has an intention for sorrow. First of all, yes, it brings repentance, but even more so than that, it can produce fruit. How can one sad emotion do so much? Well, when God's behind it, he can have many uses for it. In verse 11, Paul writes, See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. This is an image of a changed heart, a soft heart, a heart that more and more seems to be repulsed by what destroys it, by what hardens it, by sin, as it, and is instead drawn more and more to what is good. I remember once hearing about a man who had decided for health reasons to convince himself that he hated chocolate. He'd been addicted to it and had way too much. And so, somehow, he taught himself to believe that chocolate tasted like dirt, that it was disgusting. And he claimed that he'd won that battle, that he could no longer enjoy at all the taste of chocolate. I'm not saying we should follow this man's example, but the kind of extreme example that this is, I think it shows something of the kind of change that is happening in this verse. To be able to see the sin that had been attractive in our lives and see it for the disgusting thing it really is. To be no longer attracted to it, to be repulsed by it instead. But to not have regret, instead to have only thankfulness at the forgiveness we have. This is a heart that's looking forward, not back. A heart that's looking forward to a time when there will be no more sorrow. And this is also part of God's intention for sorrow, to bring it to an end. Looking forward to a time when God will dwell with his people. And as we read in, in Revelation chapter 21, uh, verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. That is the end point of sorrow. So Paul could have easily just hoped here that the church in Corinth would sort itself out over time. And maybe some of them would, but probably not many. This here is an encouragement for us to recognize sin for what it is. The fact that it is destructive. That um, it's not going to just sort itself out. It's a risk to call out someone's sin. And it's going to cause sorrow. It's a scary thing to do. But something that can produce great fruit. And this passage also reminds us that emotional engagement with our world, with the sorrow that there is, and emotional engagement with the sorrow that our own sin and the sin of other people actually has, that it actually has effects, this is a good thing too. Feeling sorrow at sin in ourselves and in the world, in the church, that is a Christian emotion. Sadness shows concern. It shows that you've got skin in the game. It did for Paul, and it does for us as well. So our world needs sorrow. As Christians, we need to make sure we look to the godly sorrow that produces fruit and leads to repentance without regret that Paul uh, details here. And we need to also, with joy, look forward to the time when there will be no more sorrow. Sorrow is God's gift to our world that is sometimes full of sorrow. Another form of sorrow in the Bible is lament. And it's healthy. It's good. 
We're, if we read in um, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 and then 4, it says, There is a time for everything, a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. There is a time to be sorrowful. It's central to the gospel story because Jesus' death is fundamentally a sad event from which God brought so much good. And as a result, all sorrow will be wiped away. Let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you that sorrow is your gift to a world that is full of things to be sorrowful about, things outside of our control, things that happen because this is a fallen world. But also, Lord, help us to be sorrowful at our own sin, not in a way that leads to despair or a way that leads to our own um, pride, but instead leads to repentance without regret, looking forward to a time when you will bring an end to sorrow and wipe away every tear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.